Hello and happy International Women's Day. Presented by Cobalt Music and AWOL, we are so excited to be bringing to you a series of Women's History Month microcasts. My name is Emily Bynes. I'm Senior Director of Creative here at Cobalt, and I have the honor of introducing today's guests. This Artist on Artist conversation features two of our very own incredibly talented creators, Violet Skies and Charlie McLean. Violet and Charlie are writers, producers, and artists in their own rights, no pun intended, but they are also friends and business partners in an organization they started together called She Writes that you'll hear more about in this conversation. The two are working tirelessly to change the statistics in the global music industry, bringing together the best female talent from multiple genres all around the world. Please be aware that this conversation briefly touches on the subject of sexual assault. We are so honored to have these two kick off this podcast series, so sit back and have a listen, and please enjoy. Hello, Charlie McLean. Hello, Violet Skies. Um, So we are recording this lovely podcast uh, for Women's History Month for AWOL, Um, and I'm just here to say you are a producer, writer, creator, musician extraordinaire. (laughs) And you are a fabulous songwriter, producer, and basically all-round legend. (laughs) Um, so Let's Charlie and I, aside from being friends for years and years now, have also run, um, uh, what, it's, it's like an organisation company called, um, called She Writes, and we run all female writing camps, and we are venturing to do new, exciting things as well soon, which we can't yes. say until it's Un- Unannounced, but watch this space, darling. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so we, we met a few years ago. Uh, 2016. Oh, I know it's a long years time. now, uh, and we've worked on music together for for many different things for me and for other projects and for other artists. Um, but we've also run like ten all female writing camps over the last four years now. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah. So why did we start doing right doing that? <laughs> um. Well, it happened. As a result of us making a record together, um, mm-hmm. and that in itself happened by accident. Yep. Um, and at the end of us working together and me co-producing the the EP that we did, um, we sat down and we wound up having the conversation that I, as a female producer, have with all girls, uh, which is, I never worked with a girl before. This is really different and really awesome. And why can't we do this all the time? Um, and because I, well, at that point was having that conversation every time I worked with anybody and still to this day, five years later, I'm still having this conversation with everyone I work with pretty much. Um, we sat and had a coffee and had a, a brainstorm about how we could bring more women together. And I didn't even know what a writing camp was at this point, but Mm -hmm. we decided, Hey, we'll just do a writing camp. Like it ain't no thing. I think we thought initially, you were like, wouldn't it be nice if we like hired a house in like a big Airbnb in France and just invited loads of our friends? And I was like, yeah, I think I, I know a few girls who like produce their own music. Mm. I didn't know if they produce for others. I'd like worked with, um, I actually worked with Marie Dahlstrom in 2015 mm. and we wrote together and I remember she did the demo and mm-hmm. she definitely wasn't calling herself a producer, but she was, I knew she could use it. Yeah. <laughs> Marie's actually gone on to produce albums worth of music. She is incredible. Oh, she's but ridiculously thinking, oh, yeah, wonderful musician. A couple of my friends from London and we could find some people because I met you in Berlin and that's where we worked. We could do that. And then, yeah. and then I went away over Christmas and, and then I called PRS Music and said, can I have some money for a writing <laughs> gown? And they were like, I mean, it sounds like a great idea, all women, et cetera, et cetera you'll have to apply and he was like uh is it just you or are you like an organization or a business and I was like why and he said well you know if there's more of you then you know if it's an organization then you can apply for more money Mm. so I went home and googled make business (laughs) (laughs) and we started she writes originally it had a different name it was bitch please which yeah. we found to be not as PR friendly. <laughs> it is It is a little tricky to get a bank account and very, very awkward to have that conversation with the IRS uh, yes. about what the name of your business is yeah. because they think because you're British, you're joking. 
and yeah. then it turns out you're not and it's quite awkward but very fun so yeah yeah thanks to the people at the irs for being so understanding but we've learned from that experience yes yeah i remember <laughs> i remember hmrc wouldn't let us register it and no. <laughs> bitch p that had to be bitch without the i mm-hmm. so that was our first learning yeah we've yes. had a lot of learnings over the past few years so our Many. first camp was a year later in 2017 and we had 60 plus people on over five days it was just mm-hmm. an absolute I mean it was wild and we did it with the help of um Michaela at Tile Yard as well who mm-hmm. was amazing and brought in some Swedish people for us mm-hmm. and then we ended up in Sweden and then it just, and it just rolled spiral, out from yeah. there yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think it's been this sort of wild ride that we didn't expect where we started doing one camp thinking oh this will be cool and that mm. got completely out of hand and was huge and really just just wonderful and then from there as soon as people started hearing about the organization they were like oh can we support it and so that kind of rolled into us being able to host camps where we didn't have to Mm -hmm. uh, ask people to pay to be on them because that's one of the one of the big deterrents with writing camps is like Mm -hmm. you shouldn't really have to pay to write music um Mm -hmm. because it's your job and if you're a professional, you don't, you don't pay to do that. And also that. so um, many of the women we work with are unmanaged and unsigned and overlooked. Mm-hmm. Yep. So ultimately their publisher can't pay for them to be on writing camps, which exactly. is often the case. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, yeah, ultimately we wanted to remove a lot of the barriers. And so we were lucky that everyone from Splice to Ableton to YouTube, when we did the mm-hmm. LA one, yep. to loads of other amazing audio companies have given us you know, gear or money or studios to make things possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been amazing how much support has been pushed forward around this. And I feel like 10 years ago, Mm. it wouldn't have been taken seriously. But because Mm. of the timing at which we started doing this, we were doing something wonderful, but also riding the crest of an amazing wave of the work of so many women pushing Mm. this issue forward so that it's at the forefront of everybody's minds of where are all the women in songwriting mm-hmm. where are the women in studios where are the women in pro audio and that they do exist but we have to we wound up needing to do something to show people that they exist yeah. and that well, the it's thing not is, like his, historically they ha- they have always existed yep. going way 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 back to talk you know talking about female uh, composers or painters even or playwrights mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, they had to be super rich, yeah. and were usually like landed aristocracy, or uh, yeah, or just had incredible family support, or came from really educated backgrounds where mm-hmm. going to college or music school felt like an appropriate thing for yeah. a, a nice young woman to play piano, and then she moves into composing. But to be taken seriously is is a whole other thing. And so exactly, it, it we I remember thinking like they don't exist. Uh, mm-hmm. but actually they do and I mean mm. in the case of I always use the case of Andrea Andrea Rocha mm. yeah. who told me my friend Hannah Jane Lewis a musician she told me on the first London camp she was like oh Andrea is a producer and then I messaged Andrea and Andrea sent me some just some SoundCloud links and she said I'm not really a producer I just like you know can engineer and record vocals and I play a few instruments and I was like okay well for yeah. starters it does sound a lot like producing um, and then she sent me those tracks and I said so who who made all of this? And she said, oh, me, but I'm not a producer. And I just thought, Interesting. <laughs> and I think the challenge, the challenge is, is getting uh, women to feel confident. I feel like yeah. five years on, it's a different conversation. I literally find a new female producer on TikTok or Instagram every day. Yeah. I'm constantly getting it sent to me because in um, I feel like TikTok especially prioritises like, creating and going behind the scenes and it yeah. takes away that mystique mm-hmm. and so so many women are able to just find stuff online and be like okay previously I just produced in my bedroom and produced myself but now I'm just going to make beats online and we've watched other mm-hmm. women do it yeah and I don't have to be I don't actually have to be in the studio the pandemic's actually meant that you don't have to be in the studio with yeah. scary boys which I think is yeah. a lot of the uh, absolutely the barriers of being like brave enough to be the girl at the desk, at the computer, mm. with four, two, three boys sat behind you. Yeah. But now think, you, you can you can show what you can do on the internet, and yeah. And there's other women who see that, and ultimately the wave of confidence is sky high right now. Yeah. And I think also the the pandemic 
in it by its own nature, by the fact that, you know, everybody's become comfortable with writing online and doing mm -hmm. Zoom sessions and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of changed the narrative of how we think of uh, getting work as writers and producers, right. how we view connections, because there essentially are no gatekeepers at this point. Like, you don't wait for somebody to kind of give you permission to enter a room because there's no room to enter. Right. So you can DM anybody and just get a session and you'll wind up working with people you'd otherwise never work with. Mm -hmm. um, for example, a wonderful friend who is like a very new friend, but a woman who I just think is fabulous, a new signing with Cobalt, uh, Britt Poles, who goes under the name Pollyanna. Uh, we met randomly kind of through a connection that had nothing cobalt didn't put that together yet mm. they were about to and they were like oh we're already working together mm -hmm. but she lives in amsterdam which is not far away from where i am in hamburg we wouldn't have met necessarily otherwise straight mm. away but we've written a whole bunch of songs and we've already got things that are on hold going to be released really soon yeah. loads of interest in everything we're writing together because we have a really good writing connection yeah thank you that, internet you're making our jobs kind of pointless <laughs> but it's it's one of those things that's wonderful about uh the the fact that the pandemic has happened it's one of the mm. sort of few plus points that you can find is the fact that there are there are essentially no boundaries whether it's geographical or anything else so there's nothing mm. to stop anybody from doing what it is they want to do which means that for women who would traditionally have been not allowed to go into sessions or you know been put mm -hmm. in the corner there's no corner to be put into yeah you know that there's no sense of being disallowed from anything yeah. and i know from from when i compare before the pandemic and now how much mm -hmm. more work i have how much better my sessions that's are that's crazy it's ridiculous well that's how much that's, that's a testament to as much as we want to say like when we started it we i remember googling because to apply for the money for prs so, you know, a legitimate foundation. So I had to do a bunch of, like, research for the application. Uh, and I remember Googling, both of us Googling, Googling, like, there must have been an all-female writing camp before, at least oh. in Europe. Yeah. And we couldn't find anything other than, like, a production retreat in Sweden that I think Robin yeah. had done and a bunch of producers. Yeah. But there wasn't, like, and a traditional was... pop writing camp. And it, no. I remember when we started proposing the idea, people were like, oh, yeah, that, why, like, I yeah. was shocked that other publishing companies hadn't done it or other labels hadn't done it, but maybe they just thought, oh, there aren't any and it's yeah. too much effort to find them and yeah. people weren't discovering online like they are now. So I don't think mm -hmm. there's ever been um, anyone saying, you can't do that. No one's actually ever told no. us we can't do that. It's just about no. having the, the where, the, the... The guts, the gall, the gumption, the audacity <laughs> to do it. You know what I mean? It's just like yeah, needing absolutely. to... The, the, I mean, yeah, the, I mean, the proverbial balls to do it, right? Yeah. You yeah. just need to be so. brave I mean, enough. I remember when it was in those months leading up to the first camp being told by a number of, not a lot, but a small number of men, four, uh, that it was a silly idea. I did actually have a few people say that's really exclude. Um, it's really like not exclusive, but like you're excluding people. Yeah. And I was like, do you mean men? I'm excluding <laughs> men. And then you just pull up on your phone pictures of writing camps from every single major writing camp of the last ten years. You find two women usually yeah. stood on the sides, and I hundred percent bet you they are not producers. Yeah. They're just being. They're there, and they're like, hey, we're the. They're like, oh, we, we should probably get some people in so that they can sing the songs we write. Yeah, and I feel exactly. like that is a real afterthought and mm. everyone complains about there being a boys club and technically I guess they're complaining about us being a girls club but until you have some like forced exclusivity lots of mm. these women were not necessarily confident enough to produce in front of men or even sometimes yeah. write the songs mm. they wanted to write and now I feel like we're moving towards a space where 50-50 camps should yeah. be the norm um, but also uh, LGBTQ plus uh, people wouldn't mm. always be comfortable in a very, very male writing camp environment. Mm. Yeah. This is something that I've discussed a number of times with um, gay artists who've talked about how nice it is, like specifically male gay artists mm. who's talked about 
they talk about how nice it is to be able to work with a producer and talk about relationships with men, like romantic relationships with men, sexual right. relationships with men, and actually have the producer understand what you're talking about. Oh because if it's a bunch God, of straight guys in the room, they don't know what you're talking about, and they might be really uncomfortable with it. So you have to mm. sort of censor the way that you're speaking about your own relationships because you can't just talk about everything in the way that you should be able to in a songwriting session. So mm. I think... I think there are so many facets to which having people with different life experiences, and that's what mm -hmm. it kind of boils down to. It, it's the breadth of life experience that creates great songwriting as much as being yeah. able to write a catchy hook or a great beat. It's understanding how to communicate the life experiences that other people are going to be able to relate to when they listen to the songs. Right. And if you only have a small subset of all of the people, Mm -hmm. then everything is filtered through that small subset. And when yeah, you're talking well, about talk straight about guys, male, yeah, we talk that's about the male gaze, got. right? Yeah. But, yeah. sorry, I cut you off. What do you say at the end there? Um, I can't remember. I haven't had enough coffee yet. It's early oh. in the morning. Well, it's, it's actually not. Filter, I'm just yes. not a good, I'm not a good morning person. <laughs> but yes, the male gaze. Yeah. Is, it, ultimately, that's what it is. And it extends to music. And it's not, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be uh, you know, some of the more problematic stuff like lyrics that we look back on now and think that's pretty awful. But it's mm. also, you know, artists like, and I use this example, someone like Cardi B or Nicki Minaj or yeah. even even Adele, yeah. who was, I remember thinking when she talks about turning up to somebody's house un uninvited, it's kind of, she's admitting to stalking somebody <laughs> and she sounds crazy but she's mm. doing it with such confidence. And then you've got artists like Cardi B who will talk about their sexuality in yeah. extremely explicit terms. Like th there, is, there are no holds barred on how she feels like she wants to talk about her love, her life and her yeah. body. Mm. And I know that makes people uncomfortable, but you skip back to any other songs by men within yep. that genre and others. Yep. And the way they talk about women and they talk about their own bodies and their own sexuality that the, the, there are two different standards and I think that's it was really interesting actually my boyfriend's a producer and he we were driving the other day listening to a song produced by this uh, Danish duo women mm. and he kind of had this epiphany moment uh, where he said I'm not saying that I can tell this has been produced by women but mm. it just has a, a different sound mm. and a different approach to how they've produced it and yeah. he was like isn't it incredible how different music would sound if more women were producing, you know, commercial music? Yep. And what that would look and sound like and put, be pushing barriers. Mm. And I think, even though I've always thought that, hearing it from someone else who works in production every day, works in music every day, was like, yes. Because I know remember when we thought when we first started working, we were like, what does music made entirely by women sound like? Really, what what does it sound like? Does it sound any different? And the answer is, yeah. not truly, not not completely different, mm. but it but it has a just a different viewpoint. Yeah, because ultimately and that perspective is so important. You viewed the world from a whole different standpoint. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's what that's what we're discovering uh, more mm. more and more. Yeah. And that also, I think, I mean, this is something I've discovered over time as, as a producer in the time that I've kind of grown from not knowing I was a producer and I was producing to having to have somebody tell me you're a producer, be a mm. producer. And then, you know, being mentored through that process yeah. by um, Rupert Hine, RIP. Mm -hmm. We love Rupert. He's he's one of the reasons why this whole thing exists. Um mm -hmm and just he was the greatest chap ever mm -hmm. um and he was the one who kind of told me you're a producer go be a producer women should always be producers but you're going to be a great one but when i first started i was after i kind of realized okay yeah this is really what i'm doing mm -hmm. with my life this is really i'm i am actually capable of being really good at this i realized 
and it, this has been a fairly recent discovery over the last couple of years, I've been trying to emulate the way that men make music. I've been trying to force myself into a box creatively to sound mm. like other people because I didn't want anyone to know I was a female producer. I didn't want to sound different. And I, and I know that it's partly just, you know, a lot of it's just my own brain, my own ears, everybody's different. But I realized there was still this bit of imposter syndrome going on of, well, I, I, I need to make sure I fit in with all the other producers so that they think that I'm good without right. realizing that what I'm bringing to the table is what for me as just being myself is exactly why people want me. They don't want me to sound like the guy next to me. They want mm -hmm. me to sound like me. And then they want me to bring that to, to whatever it is that they're doing to make their record the best that it can be for them, you know? And that's, right. that, that kind of feeds into the idea that, um, that there's something intrinsic about looking around you and feeling like a, an outsider that will always have an impact on the way that you create. And whether it's conscious or subconscious, if you are in a minority, whatever that minority might be, it will always have some kind of an effect on the way that you create, mm -hmm. um, I, I believe personally anyway. Yeah. Um, and actually this is a conversation I've had um, with men of colour recently, mm -hmm. uh, producers and writers who have often been pigeonholed for the kind of music they should be making. Yeah. Um, and ultimately it's not pop, you yeah. know? Uh, yeah. And in the same in the same ways that we prioritise... Um, diversity on our camps and we've, we you know we aim for a, an equal spread for minimum 50 50 of women of color on our camps and especially in the last two years yeah. it's in, it's important to understand that feminism extends to to ultimately everybody mm. Feminis yeah. for, feminism is for, for everybody for men included yeah. and it also allows us to really be reaching for equality in terms of everybody being able to make the music they want however they want yep. without being pigeonholed being able to be sensitive being able to be strong being able to be whatever they want I, that's mm -hmm. that's why I'm, I'm a massive advocate for artists like Cardi or Megan or anyone who I think has had a massive backlash from mm -hmm. making music that is really not that controversial compared to no. other stuff that's come before no. um, you think about 50 Cent's Candy Shop or various other songs that mm -hmm. had what I think to be explicit, you know, technically explicit lyrics, but I love oh, the song yeah. and I feel exactly the same about Cardi. Like, yep. she's had so much backlash for saying stuff men have otherwise said. Yep. Um, and ultimately, on the other side of that, artists like James Blake have come out and said, please stop calling me a sad boy. Mm. No one's going around calling Adele sad girl. No one's going yep. around calling other art female artists racist. Like, that's why feminism extends both ways. Because... It should it should be okay for anyone to be anything and not be confined by you know prescribed gender roles of what I mean yeah. the the bizarreness of that the freedom of music is to make whatever you want but still mm. so many people feel confined by gender roles even Absolutely. though music is completely the opposite and it is it is almost genderless yeah and it's because, it's very purpose is about expression of self and then mm -hmm. being able to give that to other people. To, to do whatever they want with essentially yeah. because it has complete freedom to it but one of the most important things in music is that it gives people a, a sounding board to their own feelings mm -hmm. you know if you're sad you listen to a sad song you might have a cry and feel better if you listen yeah. to a breakup song when you have a breakup it'll remind you someone else has had a breakup too mm -hmm. yeah, that's part of what pop music is yeah but if only certain people are only allowed to say and do and sing in certain ways and say yeah. certain things. What, what are we saying? We're saying that our audience can only be, do, think, say certain things. So right. it's sort of, it's a symptom of a huge issue that we have culturally going right the way back mm -hmm. through history that, you know, everybody has their little space they have to live in and, you know, woe betide the man or woman who tries yeah. to get out of it. Um, but I think we are in a really privileged position right now in the time that we're in because, you know, we're both millennials. I'm 35 and I've been doing music my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen and heard and experienced some ridiculous things throughout yeah. my career. But I think that I feel a lot like Gen Z 
I want to say kids, but you know, a lot of them are now kind of adults. Mm-hmm. So it feels a bit weird. I'm like the new kids, uh, because I'm an old lady. Um, the you know the the next generation of young people view the world so radically differently mm-hmm. from the world that you and I grew up in, mm-hmm. and I think for so many of them, this stuff just doesn't stick anymore. You know the yeah. idea that that men can't talk about their mental health, the idea that sexuality is an issue, and, mm-hmm. you know, an issue for people, or that, that sexuality they, you know, is binary, or that gender is binary. Exactly, these things. For so many young people now, just that's just not the way the world works, mm-hmm. and they're going to be in charge soon. I and know, yo, I'm wait. excited for that because I, I can't think wait. they're really awesome. <laughs> <A-O-C>. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and now I, f- um, I feel that I feel that, and I feel that I, I had a conversation with someone the other day saying it was just a very honest and open open question. Do you feel like you're you're doing more damage by segregating women, hmm. and? Ultimately, what you have to remember is that some things have definitely changed, but there's also yeah. a really, really basic uh, issue of, of safety. Yeah. And whilst we are experiencing like society being more accepting, we hear consistently, constantly, doesn't matter if you know they're a young uh, YouTuber or they are some old film producer, the the Me Too movement that has run through society and yeah. the, the outing of, of ultimately um, uh, uh, some horrific sexual um, predators or, or just sexual abuse that has occurred in mm. often very creative environments and non-creative environments yep. has existed. And I think we, we've been in the room when girls have told us on, on our camps hey, I've been on a camp before and this happened to me. Hey, I've been in a session before and this happened to me. Hey, I was picked up from the train station by a producer and this happened to me. And ultimately, yes, I wish we didn't have to do this. I genuinely wish. Whilst I love doing this and I love working with women, I wish all camps were 50-50. I wish we didn't have to remind record labels to include women when they started Mm. looking for writers for their artists. I wish we didn't have to you know, remind managers to sign women. But mm. ultimately, that's what we still have to do because, um, to to our viewers, the average number across management, publishing, labels, uh, and also in the business side of things, we're looking at 16 to 33% maximum. We're around mm. the 25% mark, really. For yeah. every four men that are signed, one woman is signed. Yeah. Um, across management, publishing and labels. Yep. And in that's just in the UK really and, and the US. When it comes to yeah. production, we're looking at six to seven percent. Mm, at best. At best. At absolute best. Um, and that includes, you know, countries like Sweden bumping the numbers up where there's a lot more Yeah. There's a lot more female producers they're there, there's a lot more writers and they all get the exposure, they're all getting the yeah. big cuts. So um, yeah, I, I don't I don't wish that we had to do the segregation thing. I don't yeah. I don't it, you know but ultimately, forcing the issue forces a lot of people's hands and allows women that were otherwise overlooked to be discovered. Mm-hmm. Provides a safe space to work in, provides a safe space to be confident, provides a safe space without sexual assault. Yes, which is <laughs> and, nice. You which know, is we nice. like that. And, um, oh, just to flag cobalt if you're recording this, potentially put a trigger warning before the last, last couple of things I said. Yes. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I wish we didn't have to do that. But isn't it nice to create a safe space uh, until the rest of the world is caught up and we're not consistently dealing with um, with that kind of culture? Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's, there's still so much room to grow. Mm. And I don't I think that we all have a responsibility to not stop until we achieve what we set out to achieve which is actually and it's not about it's not about numbers you know it's not about like you know a, a quote unquote diversity hire or whatever Mm-mm. it's about actually people having the opportunity for the same visibility as everybody else Mm-mm. to be heard to be to to 
to just be themselves right. and be respected for that. Nobody's guaranteeing that, you know, you come on a, a She Writes camp, you know, you're going to wind up having a, a, a Grammy and a multi-platinum selling whatever. Mm -hmm. It's it's that if you if you sit there and you are just you being a producer, doing what you do, by and large, you will not be noticed and you will not be taken seriously. Now, that is changing a lot very quickly within the music industry. Mm -hmm. But I know that the difference between before I did She Writes mm -hmm. and afterwards, that's when my career started. Oh, and I was same. doing my career for years before that, but same. I never made any money. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew who I was. A lot of the time, people just thought I was someone's girlfriend. Didn't matter who I was with, where I was. It people didn't just matter thought, if that girlfriend had produced all that person's music either. Yeah. And even if it wasn't about that that particular subject. <clears throat> um, yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, for a long time, there was just, I couldn't get my, I couldn't get off the starting line. And yeah. I think that through better representation, which she writes, I'm very blessed and I'm sure you feel the same way. It's given me mm -hmm. the opportunity to be like, hey, I'm that she writes girl. I'm a producer and I'm good at my job. Here's some stuff I did. And yeah. people, because we have the connections and people respect the brand, essentially, it kind of gives you an in. But also by being on the camps, it means that, you know, those songs that people write on the camps, they go out and they get put under people's noses and they come from She Writes, She Writes. Mm -hmm. It's a respected place for good music, not just, oh, yeah. here's some girls. Yeah, um, and it has yeah, reached that point. It took us a while. I think the first yeah. one, I remember sitting at the table in Tyliard Studios where we'd done it and Michaela, who kind of found me there and I remember I was a bit shell-shocked at the end of the week mm -hmm. and I just said I don't understand you know we've been asked to do this camp in Sweden now and I don't know how we're gonna do it and she was like it was the imposter syndrome thing yep and it was she shout out Michaela said you've this is imposter syndrome and someone has said this to me before another woman has said mm -hmm. this to me before is that uh, nobody knows what they're doing and ultimately you did just do it so yeah. y it's not like you can't do it or you didn't deserve to do it. You you have done it now. And mm -hmm. I feel like those moments in 2017 where I was uh, publisherless, managerless, and yeah. without, uh, you know, I released nothing through AWOL at that point. I had no distributor support. Um, was a real turning point because I remember thinking, at that point I was then going for publishing meetings thinking, oh, all right, well, I've set up camps, so what, what are you going to do for me? And it gave me a sense of confidence that I previously didn't have. Yeah. Even though I considered myself to be really confident, which is bizarre, really. Mm. Um, and, and so watching that, like, evolve in my own brain has been great because I've reached a point even now as an artist and as a writer where I'm like, OK, I'm in the room and I know why I'm here now. Mm. I'm not faking it. And, yeah, I'm still nervous before loads of my sessions. And, yeah, I still doubt myself because you mm. have creatively doubting yourself days. Yeah. But the confidence I feel... I remember I had a manager that texted me once after a show and said, have you put on weight? And at the God. time, I remember thinking, oh, that's... Yeah, I probably have. That's really bad. Mm. And since I've looked back, and I'm like, okay, that would just wouldn't happen to me now. Mm. Because... Well, that's like a, that's like a real-life YouTube comment. Like, yeah. what's what's that What's that for? But mm. this, is, this is the thing. You you grow to the point when you have enough positivity around you that can push back against all those negative influences that you will mm. find all over the place in your life, you start to realise that you are entitled to your confidence. Right. And that's so important, knowing that you are entitled to believe in yourself, which mm -hmm. I think that so many people, and, you know, men as well, it's not just a female it's thing. It's not, no, it isn't. It's across the board. There are so many people who don't know how to step into their own shoes. Mm -hmm. But if the, if the world that you're trying to move into doesn't want you there in so many ways, um, you will always feel like, oh, I'm... I, I, I must be wrong. It's like your yeah. Your well, then I argue we, you. to do what we always have said, which is we were really tired of knocking on doors and mm. asking for seats at somebody else's table. I was yeah. so tired of that. I was so tired mm -hmm. of not getting the answers or the responses I want, even though I knew I was talented. Mm. And ultimately, you just build your own door, or yep. you just build your own table. Exactly. And 
turns out there's actually enough tables and doors to go around <laughs> and yep. you don't you don't you don't need as much of the other people as you thought that you did you don't need yep. as much of their approval or as a their insight or their support even yeah I don't even need them to know who I am mm. I don't care <laughs> I don't care. And that's such I, a beautiful space to reach, mm. isn't it? Of like, well, I don't I don't care about your approval. I'm yeah. doing my thing and this is my thing and everybody loves my thing and everybody mm. wants this thing because we're all sharing this thing. If you would like to come and have a look, you may. Yeah. I will allow that. You know, yeah. it's that's the feeling that you get of having that kind of confidence because that is that's the way that the world operates for the most mm -hmm. part. It's like, come and have a look. And maybe if you play your cards right, maybe one day you'll get a seat at this table. It, you know, when you have it, when, when, when you're able to switch it around, it's amazing how much it does for your own life. Yeah. And just to be able to be so enriched in terms of confidence, in terms of being able to move forward and knowing that you are right yeah you know. and I actually think that's something I struggled with as well because I remember thinking people were saying oh you're so you're so good for doing this and I was thinking not really like if you know if you only knew how much I got back from this mm. aside from the fact that we get to write with these women and we get yeah. to be on the camps yeah we don't get paid <laughs> for the camps that <laughs> uh, you know essentially we do these as a non-for-profit and just yeah. make sure we can cover our flights some of the time mm -hmm. um what you get back is nuts, really. Yeah. Like, I remember there's that Friends episode where Phoebe's like, oh, there's no good deed that you can mm. do without... Because you end up feeling nice about yourself. Or so, yep. something. There's there, Ultimately, there's no selfless act ever. Yep. And I don't, I feel like that about she writes. I'm like, if you only knew the number of incredible women I have in my life now mm -hmm. that I've managed to get as a result of being in these camps and running them. Yeah. It's just nuts. It is. And I, and it's, it feels like a little club. And it doesn't. It's not an exclusive club because shout out. By the way, look at our Instagram and our uh, website, and all of our uh, emails are open. Just send your applications, and it takes us a long time because there's hundreds. But we do listen mm -hmm. to everything. We yep. have a little. We have a little growing team who are helping us listen to stuff as well. Yeah. Um, yep. And we have we have put people on camp through those applications. Yeah. But yeah, it does feel like a little club. Yeah, and it's a beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of because not only do we get so much on a on a personal level, on a professional level, mm. and you know we get to connect not just with other people, but we you know we connect women with each other who then go on to collaborate in the long term. I love that, but bit. that's that's amazing. Yeah, for me, my favorite part of it is seeing the people who come on with no confidence, mm. and you see there's like a spark of something. And then you see where they wind up mm -hmm. and how much things change and and where things grow to for them. And that is wild. And yeah. even if it's just the tiniest, tiniest little, you know, speck of confidence that they get from that moment of you're here, you're a part of something that's like it's those camps, they are joyful, they are yeah. fun, they are happy because it's all people together for a common goal and it's not mm -hmm. just about writing music it's sharing the experience yeah um, and i do miss that pandemic aside i do miss being yeah. in the room oh my we, God. some of some of our favorite camps in sweden and berlin we got to listen to the songs at the end of every night mm. and i miss that a lot because yeah. we we would i remember in the german camp we'd be crying and we'd be laughing and mm -hmm. we're just everyone was having like a super trans it was a super transformative time for me that yeah. whole 2017 2018 yeah running those first initial camps and I remember even with mm. the YouTube camp because we didn't really know YouTube kind of helped us with the organization and all these execs turned up and we were listening to all the songs with everybody and it was just like okay I can't this is this is mind-blowing for me now yeah that's and it's this is music made by women and we're all listening to it and enjoying it and yeah I was thinking as well, like, Andrea, who I spoke about earlier, has actually now just produced one of my singles. Um, mm. And it's a duet with a with a guy called Billy Lockett, and it's two girls and one dude, oh, and it's song. super lovely. And then Emma Rosen, who did our German camp, mm -hmm. also known as Waves, has gone on to write the new Smash Zoe Reese single. Mm. Uh, and then that's in the space of three years of... I remember when she came on that camp, she was like... She so came did, a day early she to came check in because she was yeah. nervous. 
<laughs> she was so nervous she came a day early and now she's like a signed international platinum selling songwriter. Yeah. And well, I don't think that's just down it. to our camps. Oh but no, ultimately, of course not. But ultimately, it, it that, sometimes this is the first camp a girl has been invited to. Yeah. On some in, on some occasions. Yeah. And yeah, it's a uh, yeah. We've had a lot of fun, haven't we? We do, we we have we always <laughs> do. And I, I I say long may it continue. You know, we're not yeah. done yet. No. Um, but things are changing, and I think. I think. Everything is looking bright for the future you mm -hmm. know when it when it comes to this whole issue as i said before like i think there's a new generation of people coming up now like you look at the uptake in a lot of a lot of educational institutes yeah and the number of girls going into production and songwriting mm -hmm. is skyrocketing i think yeah. it was two years ago fender said that the uh fender guitars said that the number of um, girls and boys men and women uh buying their guitars mm -hmm. was the same i think it was fender it might have been gibson so I have wrong, a funny feeling it was Gibson. Might be. I can't yeah. remember. Either way, the number of girls playing guitars is up. It's so cool. I mm -hmm. was like the only female guitar. They were when I was studying. Um, I was one of nearly a hundred guitarists on my music course, and there was there was one one other girl in my That's year. That's nuts. Yeah. I just don't and even I, think that would be a thing now. I think there's definitely still a lack of access in some engineering roles and stuff. But mm. the more women that produce, the more um, the more that there will be engineers. I mean, what is it yeah. Rack Studios? Yep. Famous for hiring women. Yep. Famous. We have Steph, and, uh, Steph, Steph Marziano, yep. uh, Manon Grandjean, and now like yeah. the, where those two girls are is Stratosphere. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah there's, some, there's some cool stuff happening. And I'm glad yeah. we're just here to witness it. I, I must, like, shout out our, uh, other contemporaries because we're surrounded by lots of other incredible organisations. Yeah. Uh, everything from uh, Girls I Rate to She Is The Music um, to Girls Make Beats and many, mm -hmm. many other companies and organisations who are doing similar things within within women in music. Um, but, yeah, we are we are very lucky to be part of it, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. We, just got, we just got the idea done. <laughs> yep. And that's the wonderful thing. It's like there's there's not a sense of competition between different mm -hmm. organisations doing any of this because we are all out for the same goal, yes, which please. is gender equality. It's not just about mm -hmm. feminism. It's about gender equality, whatever gender means for everybody. But it's about getting rid yeah. of the idea that there is there are haves and have nots because yeah. these are our bodies. We don't make music just... We make music with our hands and our lungs, sure, but for the mm -hmm. most part, we make music with our ears and our minds mm -hmm. and with this, and that does not have a gender. Yeah. So why should there be a reason for numbers to be low when it comes to women in music? There isn't one. There, there just yeah. isn't one. There isn't so, a reason. Yeah, and yeah. so for the comments that sometimes we do get on our Instagram posts, mm. we, just like as a final note, we're not here to defend if women can make music. No. ever I often get that comment well they're just not as good and ultimately Blah. it's it's not even like we're, we're just not even here to debate that we already know they can it's a yep. it's a fact it's just a case of giving them a platform to be able to do it yep yeah. <sighs> that was a nice chat oh, I feel great yeah. now I'm going back my day yeah. feeling like extra it's motivated <laughs> I, don't, I think I think we've chatted for a really long time actually I think we've overrun a little bit but, I don't even um, know how long we were supposed to talk for uh, about 25 minutes. Someone stop us. <laughs> There's no one here to stop us. That's stop the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie McLean, my and I are best friends in the world. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. I love you, darling. <laughs> Miss you. Miss you. We've got to go Bye, to the club soon. Yes, please. <laughs> when it's allowed. Uh, thank you very much, yes. Cobalt and AWOL, and happy Women's History Month. Ciao. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.